Welcome back to part three in our series of World Cup meeting sports washing. You've heard all about Argentina in 1978 and Italy in 1934. Now it's time to hear about Brazil. The Brazilian armed forces established a military dictatorship on April 1st, 1964 with the support of the United States. The US Navy had ships positioned off the coast of Rio de Janeiro in case Brazilian troops required military assistance. The US recognized the military coup and the arrival of a new government in Brazil via force as a legitimate one. In fact, they suggested that the new government represented democratic forces that had arrived to power were the perfect antidote to the international spread of communism. Coup was planned and executed by the main commanders in the Brazilian army. It was also crucially supported by the Catholic Church, who were a powerful force in day-to-day -day Brazilian society. It was also supported by anti-communist movements in the middle and upper classes. A state terror campaign known as Operation Condor would follow targeting left-wing dissidents. This reign of terror was backed by the CIA in the US. Thousands of people were captured or arrested by government forces, and many more were sacked from their roles in the civil service, and the government cracked down on any form of opposition. In 1964, the military government was already using various forms of torture it had devised systematically to gain necessary information required to completely exterminate any form of opposition from groups or individuals. The disgusting and heinous methods were also used to intimidate and silence any oncoming potential threats. The torture and silencing of opposition would go on to radically increase again after 1968, and expert advisors from the US and UK had been employed to train Brazilian forces in torture and interrogation. Whatever was necessary seemed to be an acceptable means to an end, and the dictatorship used arrest without trial, false imprisonment, and torture, which even included rape or castration. Behind the scenes in Brazil, behind the years of beautiful football, very bad things were happening. Secrecy prevailed as the power of the dictatorship grew. Some deaths were reported as accidental, and many more were never reported at all. As passed in Argentina in 1978, many Brazilians disappeared, they said, as if these people had vanished into thin air. In reality, however, government officials would dismember and hide the bodies of the murdered victims. Hundreds are thought to have been killed and disappeared. 10,000 went into exile and over 50,000 were detained. Many of those, of course, were tortured. But the sad truth was that a lot of mothers would never know the fate of their lost children during the years of the dictatorship in Brazil. From 1967 onwards, freedom of speech had become silenced. Thanks to new restrictive constitution, political opposition would be a thing of the past even though, of course, the new regime had promised that this would not pass. Guidelines of the new nationalism for Brazil were economic development and anti-communism, to keep the people content and maintain order. Later on, football would also be sucked into such policies to distract from the obvious lack of democracy. The dictatorship reached the height of its popularity in the 1970s with the so-called Brazilian miracle. The regime was able to thrive as it censored all national media whilst torturing innocents and exiling dissidents. The 1970s dictatorship in Brazil had clearly learnt the dark arts from past dictators, quite possibly even from Benito Mussolini and the tactics he used in Italy to dangerous effect. When we think of Brazil today, we think of the Copacabana beach, carnival and incredible footballers. And that's true, Brazil has it all in abundance, sure. Brazil had it all back then too, in the 1970s, but unfortunately, there were a few darker clouds surrounding the country in those days as well. The 70s in this tropical paradise were far from sunny, as Brazil was under the order of a military dictatorship. This regime, like those of Argentina and Italy, also knew the value of football to the people. It could be used as a fantastic propaganda tool. The dictatorship in Brazil went on to a new level under Emilio Medici from 1969 on. He went all guns blazing to ensure that its brutal totalitarian measures were overshadowed by the dazzling joy of Joga Bonito, the beautiful game. What did Medici do? He sanctioned the construction of 13 new stadiums nationwide. A little bit of investment in football always seems to cause a great distraction. During the 70s, the government would even give places in the national championships to clubs and institutions that supported them. The 1970 World Cup victory was a monumental public relations movement for the regime. Triumph on the pitch makes for fantastic sports washing, and like the triumphs of Argentina and Italy, all three sets of dictators got what they wanted at the right time. The World Cup in 1970 was held in Mexico and not Brazil, but the famous yellow jerseys lifting that trophy was no less powerful in that moment. A national holiday was declared upon the team's return to Brazil, 
and the player's first stop was in Brasilia to meet with Medici. At the home of the regime, greetings and of course congratulations were shared. Photo shoot took place for the newspapers and each player in the squad gratefully accepted a large financial gift. On the pitch, the Brazilian national team were a stark contrast to their horrendous leadership. They were the embodiment of art, unity and joy. The team that won the 1970 World Cup left worldwide audiences in shock as players like Jarzinho, Carlos Alberto and Rivellino helped Pele to catapult their nation to glory. The Brazilians took apart a fantastic Italian team in the final. In the end, they routed to a 4-1 victory and scored some of the most beautiful and iconic team goals the globe has ever seen. The Brazilians created Joga Bonito, the beautiful game, but how ironic that it was also a front for the ugliness of what the Brazilian government was doing back home. On the road to glory, Brazil dispatched of old rivals Uruguay and the reigning world champions England. They also beat strong teams like Czechoslovakia, Peru and Romania as they danced their way to the World Cup trophy with six wins out of six. Many political activists made the agonizing decision to support Brazil's opponents. Can you quite believe it? The adopted home of football and the most successful footballing nation of all time. The land that breathes football and yet some Brazilians couldn't support their own team. Just think how bad and how serious the situation at home must have been for some fans to turn their back on the yellow jersey. In a sublime documentary recently released on Netflix about the life of Pele, some fans were interviewed about this particular predicament, and some admittedly could not keep their back turned for too long, and ended up supporting Brazil anyway. But this is the very reason why football is the perfect propaganda tool. Dictatorship knew it would be almost impossible for Brazilians to not follow their team in good times or very bad. The minority that stayed strong in their protests of not supporting the team argued that the cheers of the fans drown out the screams of the torture victims, and that was something they could not support. In 1969, with the World Cup fast approaching, Brazil coach João Saldana was fired by Medici, as he couldn't be controlled by the head of the regime. Saldana famously said, I do not mess with his cabinet. He will not mess with my team. But Medici decided to sack him and put Mario Zagallo in charge instead. He felt he could be manipulated a lot easier. It also helped that the squad Brazil had in 1970 is widely regarded as one of the best international teams of all time. Did you enjoy this video? Well stay tuned for part two coming soon.